Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, we are distinctly honored to welcome Susie Singer-Carter, filmmaker and Alzheimer's advocate, as well as Rick Montcastle, former federal and state prosecutor, to discuss their film, no country for old people welcome thank you thank you for having us our pleasure our pleasure for our viewers and listeners they may know rick from having his life or work portrayed in the series dope sick where rick was instrumental in helping to take down purdue pharma along with Susie singer carter whose film my mom and the girl was oscar nominated oscar qualified i should say Share with me how the two of you became connected. Well, in the uh, Hulu miniseries and the Dope Sick miniseries, in the very last uh, eight episode, episode eight, there's a uh, a mention of the next case that our office did that Randy Ramsire and I did, which was the Abbott Laboratories case uh, for their false marketing of Depakote for the treatment of agitation in elderly uh, dementia patients in nursing homes. And so uh, I think Susie, when she was watching the series, you know, in addition to her family experience with, with OxyContin, she had also had uh, experience with her mother being treated off-label uh, for de- with Depakote with, with uh, disastrous results. So that prompted her, I think, to to reach out to me uh, on social media uh, to, to ask if I would appear as a guest on her uh, podcast, um, Love Conquers Alls. And, and I agreed to do that. Uh, so I came on and uh, was on that podcast with her for probably a, a, a good hour and a half. It was a very lengthy discussion about the Abbott Labs case. case. And we also got into how the nursing home system works or doesn't work as the case may be as it actually is um but then uh following that susie began having issues with the nursing home that her mother was in uh and you know what uh we would characterize as uh abuse and neglect happening with her mother and she reached out to me for guidance on how to negotiate and navigate this very murky uh and complex system this nursing home system and so we had discussions on and off where i um, worked we talked about i tried to refer her and get her uh, some attorney representation in california and um you know tried to explain to her certain things that the nursing home was doing or not doing um in, in in many instances and so um you know Following the the untimely passing of her mother in July of last year, we continued the conversation and talked about how do we change this system? It is clearly broken. Her mother was uh, a longtime resident of a, you know, quote, five star nursing facility, supposedly rated one of the best by the Medicare rating system. Yet she suffered this. Uh, abuse and neglect, which I would characterize uh, for many of the elders in nursing homes, they undergo an extreme loss of dignity, right? And they undergo uh, abuse and neglect uh, that can only be described, uh, you know, from my perspective as torture. And so, yes, they're in their wane, their last years, and yes, they're going to pass away soon, but nobody should go through torture and the loss of dignity no matter how old you are and no matter how close to death you are. And so we've talked about how to change the system. And we've talked about how 
what the power of mass media is. And Susie being a filmmaker, uh, we just said, how do we change? How do we inform people? How do we educate people? How do we change attitudes about the elderly and about the treatment in nursing home? And how do we expose this tragic loss of dig dignity and tragic torture that goes on in nursing homes that are by and large funded by our taxpayer dollars uh, to the point where it should be an outrage and we want people to know about it. So that's how we got on this, embarked on this journey. And seen. <laughs> <Said well. laughs> Susie, when you had reached out to Rick, did you imagine that the two of you would eventually become partners in the film that you're producing, No Country for Old People? Um, no. <laughs> Underline exclamation point. No. I, I listen, Rick, I I I reached out to him because he was seriously a hero to me because of, of him, his work with Oxycontin and, and the farm pharmaceuticals and what my mom experienced with Depakote because that Depakote really immobilized her and put her into a wheelchair for the rest of her life, for the last eight years of her life. And, and you know, it, it rendered her incontinent. It, it was horrible. And so, you know, I think, I think the only thing, Rick, I'll say that you left out was that when Rick was guiding me, you know, I'm not litigious. And Rick was saying, you know, the only thing, first of all, he was the first person to tell me what systemic crisis meant and what I was up against. And when I was turned down by five different lawyers, because he told me you have to you have to litigate because that's the only way that's the only language they speak. Right. To to at all address or at least get some sort of uh, retribution, something in that respect. So. Uh, I got turned down by five lawyers and the final lawyer said, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you from Beverly Hills. Uh, you're not going to get any lawyer to take this case because this five star facility is beloved in Los Angeles and very well supported. And I thought that's disgusting. And that's why they're able to get away with this kind of, um, you know, behavior, the way their, their business tech, their business um, values. So uh, I found a, I did a little bit more research and found this organization called Canner, which is the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform up in San, San Francisco. They're amazing. They are they will they will listen to your story and represent you if, if they feel you have a case. So I wrote them a letter and indeed they thought I had a case and they wanted to connect me with a lawyer here in, in Los Angeles. And I said to Rick, this is my last chance. What can I do to make this lawyer take my case, right? And he said, you're a filmmaker. Put your stuff together. You've been, you know, I had been taking film of my mom, but not for this purpose, but I had a lot of it. And so my poor lawyer, <laughs> I sent her the night before our meeting, an hour and a half of basically a video deposition. Hey, and had sent it to Rick before I sent it to her to see what he thought. And and he really said, this, this is this is really valuable. This could this should be a documentary. Mm -hmm. And the next day I got a call from said lawyer, and she said, I was gonna look at one minute of this and I couldn't stop watching it. I've heard these stories my whole career, but I've never seen it. So when I realized that I could affect someone who was already, for lack of a better word, jaded, you know, accustomed to seeing and hear, or hearing these kinds of stories to actually affect her emotionally, I thought, you know, I was I was validated that storytelling is powerful. Absolutely. Be before I go on to because I want to share, have you share with us more about my mom and the girl and kind of your inspiration and motivation for that film. Rick, when she was setting out to hire or retain counsel to go after the nursing home and they're all turning her down and they're giving the reasons. Is there a similarity there between going after Purdue Pharma versus what she was trying? I, I, for me, I like instantly was envisioning kind of what you guys were up against initially when you first set out to take on Purdue Pharma. It's, um, you know, maybe there's, there's some similarity, but, so the issue that Susie was facing, and I'll, I'll kind of, they're, they're, they're a bit different. The issue that Susie was facing was that 
uh, plaintiff lawyers who file lawsuits on behalf of people uh, who are wronged in this business, kind of uh, the medical malpractice, the elder abuse. They're looking for what, how, how do they, how do you value the case? Uh, because they're going to, there's going to be an expenditure of a significant amount of money because an expert witness, ha at least one expert witness must be hired. Uh, and there are going to be costs in terms of putting together the discovery, reviewing documents, depositions, and all that. So they've got to, before they take a case, put a value on it. What is the potential recovery? Well, the two main factors normally in those kinds of cases are lost wages and medical expenses. Those are how uh, those kinds of um, tort cases, or is what they're called, are valued. Well, if you're talking about an elderly person, 80 you know, years plus person who's in a nursing home, there are no lost wages. That's a zero. And most um, residents in long term care, their medical ex their expenses are being paid for by Medicare and Medicaid. So there are no out of pocket medical expenses. So that's what those lawyers are looking at when they first look at that case. And saying, well, there's no there's no value here. If we take the case, we're going to lose money. But what I told what what I think is overlooked is that the real value in those cases is is what's called pain and suffering. And if a nursing home resident um, sustains, for example, a stage four pressure sore, I've said those words. Nobody, most people who who don't have experience in the, the nursing home business don't know what that means. They can't picture stage four pressure sore. Sounds pretty bad, but they don't, you know, don't really understand what that is. Or um, if, hey, this resident has uh, uh, undergone, has been neglected to the point where they're dehydrated. They've got, uh, um, they've suffered urinary tract infections, and now they've got sepsis, Okay. You say those words, they don't really have much meaning. But if you portray those types of issues in video, in visual form, you see how horrific it is. That's why I call it torture. Yeah. Because a stage four pressure sore is an open wound, uh, usually in, in the back or the lower back area of a resident, that goes down to the bone, okay, that is open to the bone. Most people, and even saying those words don't really come tell you the horror of someone having to live through that. So in the case, in, in these kinds of cases, in Susie's case, you know, as a filmmaker, I said, man, you can really depict the horror, the pain and suffering that your mother went through, that the family goes through because they're no, they're seeing the, the suffering of their loved one. And that's where you get the damages in this case. And that's how you have to show the lawyer that there's value in this case. So on the other hand, since you asked, uh, the issues in the Purdue case and what we were up against, that's a whole different systemic issue. That's the, the way our government is, is, is run in that you have political appointees that are running that are on the top of all of the major agencies. And those political appointees are oftentimes not there to do their best job on behalf of the government. They're there uh, all too often to advance their own careers and to provide favors to their friends in private practice because uh, it's, a re it's a revolving door system. They're going to be going back to private practice in a few years and so they, you know, you do favors for your buddies. They're going to do a favor for you when you go back to private practice. That's the sort of the, I'm going to call it corruption in government with a little C that has existed probably since the beginning of, you know, since 1783 when the, when the, uh, the constitution was passed. It, that just, that's how that system works. And so it's a little bit different in terms of trying to get decisions made of, of the type that we were looking for. Um, where you have political appointees who are uh, the final decision makers and they're making their decisions based on politics and not on the evidence and not on what justice demands. So Susie, you, you know, you provided the attorney with this film. Now, was this before you 
created My Mom and the Girl? No, My Mom and the Girl came from before. This was in 2017 and then 18 when we went to Cannes and, and were Oscar qualified. We, we went through the festival circuit. That was that was a whole nother uh, experience. That was a story about my mom. It was a short film and it was it was not a documentary. It was a narrative. It was written. It was uh, it was about my mom and a day in the life of living with me when she had Alzheimer's at the time that she was, you know, straddling the fence between acceptance and denial of her disease. And so I call it the worst and best year of my life. And I wanted people to see what I had discovered, which was how to lean into my mom's disease and to wherever she was cognitively so I could get the best out of it. And so, because it can be a very long disease. Right. And so uh, I, 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 I called it a joyous look at Alzheimer's, but I wasn't being, you know, I didn't sugarcoat it, but I certainly wanted to show where the positive uh, uh, silver linings were, where the, you know, where, cause there are, there's a, there always are yes. in everything. So, um, and I, 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 I felt very, very proud of that project. It touches people. It still touches people. It is a very real, authentic portrayal of, of the disease and of a family that loves each other and wants to figure out how to deal with this and navigate this monster. And cause it's a disgusting disease. We know that, um, and that's what that was. And it was uh, my mother was played by Valerie Harper, the one and only, and um, was her last performance. And I'm so grateful for her because she embodied it and embodied the disease, like, you know, with such authenticity and, and heart. So that's the story. And it's a wonderful film. And or, I, do you call it a film? Is that fair? A film? Yes, okay. of course. When you were creating that and after you had produced it, did you ever imagine you would be here now talking about a new film? Well, I knew I would be talking about a new film, but I didn't know it'd be this one. This, yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I'm a filmmaker. So, yeah, I'm always doing projects. But this one, I didn't know. I mean, God, a year ago, I was playing whack-a-mole in this horrible system. And, you know, the, the farthest thing from my mind was doing a film at that time. All I was trying to do was make sure my mom had some quality of life, you know, for whatever was going on. Cause I had no idea what I, I didn't realize what I was up against. So no, I didn't think I was going to be doing a film about this. Um, it's, it's not where I wanted to live for the next year or two. It's a tough conversation. Well, but I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to represent it. And I'm glad to talk about it because if I don't say something and I saw all that, then I'm as culpable. Absolutely. And, you know, I was talking with Rick earlier, you know, people don't know what they don't know. And that's the danger. You know, we recently just released uh, an episode and it's all about a family guide to restraints. And families don't realize what restraints are, that there's several different forms of restraints, whether it's chemical, physical, environmental. And they place their trust in these facilities and in these healthcare providers because they have the white coat on or they have, you know, initials after their name to, you know, clarify who they are and what their expertise is. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're always needed or necessary. And I don't want to, you know, go down that path right now. But just like yourself, when your mom's in the facility, you're placing your confidence and trust in what they're telling you. You know, just like if I go to the mechanic and I don't have a clue about working on cars and my car is making a noise and they say you need X, Y, and Z, I'm trusting their recommendation because they're the professional, right? right. And right. a lot of families find themselves in those situations where they just blindly trust because why wouldn't they? You know, healthcare, you know, has a good reputation, you know. Right. And there they're in a vulnerable they're in a vulnerable position because very vulnerable you know there's the choices that you make for for care come down to things like your you know your financial situation location right so you want to be close to as close to your loved one as possible so you have to so you know your choices get get fine fiddled down right to what you can afford 
or if you're it's a Medicare or Medi-Cal, Medicaid in California, it's Medi-Cal um, situation, then, you know, then you have to figure out where's their availability for your loved one. So you're really at the, you're really at the mercy. It's not an equal, it's not equal opportunity. You can have, you, there's more places to get your car fixed and right. better places. And you have more, you have more uh, regulations probably and read the ways to 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 you know if you have bad service to to work that out you know legally that's the that's the truth so we're we're at the mercy in in a lot of respects that way because you know we're wouldn't it be ideal to have our family at home but we're not all capable of handling certain levels of you know care and that's what these people advertise is that they are, and that's what they provide, and that's what they're getting paid for. So absolutely. Now, before we talk more about no country for old people, I do want to mention too, and you know, Rick has already brought it up. You also are a podcaster and you have your own podcast show, Love Conquers Alls. When did mm-hmm. you start the show? I started it in 2020, right after my um, festival circuit, because I felt like I really started a conversation that I wanted to continue. And I wanted to continue a positive, real conversation. And we'll yeah. we'll have yeah. links to it in the show notes. But you know, you're you're more than just a filmmaker. You're you're a tremendous advocate for families who have loved ones with Alzheimer's. You have your show, Love Conquers Alls. You know your your film, you know, My Mom and the Girl. But you also go around speaking for the Alzheimer's Association as well, correct? I I, I was very active with them and then Alzheimer's Los Angeles, and I I emceed. The Alzheimer's Walk in in San Fernando Valley here last year, which was such an honor for me, because the first time I went to a walk, it was Brian Cranston and some other big names. And this was in Los Angeles. And I was like, here I am sending people off on their walk right after my mom died. And I got to and I held up the purple flower in honor of her. And I got choked up. I didn't, you know, I it, unexpectedly and the warmth and support from the crowd was amazing, like just palpable. Yeah, that's it's it's wonderful. And we need more advocates for this work. And that brings us to No Country for Old People. What have you learned since, you know, going back to, you know, meeting those five different lawyers in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, California? What has shocked you the most out of out of this journey so far? Okay, that's the question should be what hasn't shocked me. <laughs> All right, what hasn't shocked you the most, Susie? Nothing. <laughs> no, it, no, everything shocked me. Everything has shocked me. I'm, I'm, I am Pollyanna. You're looking at Pollyanna like I literally am not Shirley MacLaine. I am not saying get the <laughs> drugs. That was not me, you know. Um, do you know what I'm referring to? The movie. <laughs> um, anyway, with with Deborah Winger. Anyway. Um, this is, I am very, I, you know, I have the disease to please. So I, I did not realize w- how bad the system was. And, and um, I didn't, I didn't know, like when Rick said, was talking about, um, you know, bed sores and, and so on and so on and so on. I, I mean, for, frankly, I've never knew what a bed sore was. I thought it was something that was sore because the word is so benign sore. It's a sore, right? It's just sore. owie. It's yeah. owie, right? It's the opposite of that. I mean, it couldn't be worse. It's it is it is it is horrifying. And the first time I saw it, and I'm I'm very I'm very strong that way. Like blood doesn't, you know, I'm I have a strong constitution. When I saw my mother for the first time with that wound, I was like, I want I got like the blood rushed from my face, right? So I I was, I mean, from I mean, just hit the ground running, going, I I don't know what world I'm in, but I'm in some altered universe that I had no idea was happening. And, and when I realized that, that that's really was, is the motivation is that look here, I am an advocate for Alzheimer's and caregivers and all these people. And I'm blindly have no idea really what the, what what the, you know, the healthcare system that's going to be taking care of my mother is all about. I'm completely clueless. So I, I represent a big, a big percentage of people out there um, I would tell people what's going on, my my colleagues, and I could tell they they thought I was overstressed. 
you know, poor Susie, she's, she's having caregiver stress, you know, this can't be happening this too much because every time I went there, there was something else egregious going on. I, I mean, honestly, like even when I look back at it, I think how, how could this all happen to one person? But it did. So that's what I learned. And that's, and what I learned is that how, how much ageism, you know, you think about ageism, I'm a writer, I'm a director. You think, oh, okay, I've been up against being a girl, a blonde haired girl, <laughs> you know, I'm up against age, you know, I, you know, people are, oh, you know, there's a, there's always a, there's always something, uh, there's always a, uh, an ism, right? There's always an ism out there. I didn't know how bad that was. The ageism and ableism is so, it's a fatal flaw that we have. And, and we, especially in, in our culture, in the American culture, we don't look at, we, we don't want to see age. We don't want to see old people. We don't want to hear about death. And we don't want to hear about, you know, uh, bed sores or sepsis or pneumonia. We don't. And so when it comes to people going into hospice and your loved one, you just want to believe that, yeah, we need to give them morphine because that keeps them comfortable. That's what the doctor said. So, you know, never mind that they don't need the morphine. Never mind that maybe they're not ready to pass. But we don't want to see it. It's scary. I understand that. I didn't want to die. I didn't want to see my mother die. But we have to put our big girl pants on at some point and, and step up, you know, when we love people. So, and I know there's other people just like me that, that, would prefer to know. And so I want to get people angry like I, I'm angry. Yeah. And hopefully before they have to experience or go through what you went through, right? Right. I don't want any, I mean, nobody should suffer. Every time I go to editing and I see videos of my mom suffering, it, it, it doesn't, I don't get immune to it. You can't get immune to that. No. No, and hopefully nobody ever would, right? Yeah. They mm -hmm. say, you know, with healthcare staff, when a client or a patient expires or, you know, passes, when it stops affecting you, that's when you need to step away because now you're just so numb to it, you know, desensitized that, you know, you probably lost that compassion component that comes along with why you may have gotten into the field to begin with. It's survival. I mean, Rick, I'll let you jump in, but I'll just say that there's a thing called, you know, moral injury that our our providers experience because, you know, it's a bad it's a bad system for the people that are really good providers because the system is so corrupt that they have they either work within that system and those rules or they leave. And working in that rules means give under those rules means giving up your values. And so that that is damaging. Right. Susie, let me um, let me ask. So what was the, do you remember the exact moment you said, you know what, we are going to turn this into a film? Was it after that lawyer? It resonated with her and it affected her or was it after that? No, it was before when Rick saw the video, when, okay. Rick said, when he said, you know, when he said, I've seen a lot because he has he's seen it all. And when he said, I well, I think Rick, I'm going to talk for you for a second, but you saw the, you know, they, they, they kept my mom from having liquid and, and food substance, you know, they decided that she needed a G tube, which she didn't. And so they, and then they, re, they forbid me from giving her any liquid for six months. And I, and Rick saw the videos of that, which is a horrible thing. And he said, you know, he's seen, he's seen all that. He's not desensitized. Don't get me wrong. Cause he's, sure. this is, a, I mean, th this is a unicorn. Yes, you are Rick, because like to be so such a powerful, fierce prosecutor and still have a heart is, you know, one of a kind. And he said, but I, but to watch your mom suffer, you know, basically dying of thirst is, he said he, it, it just affected him so strongly. And he said, you know, I really feel like this is, this might be the secret sauce. I'm that's not his words, my words, yeah. but you know, of, of, of possibly moving the needle. And that's when I thought I can do that, that I can do. I can tell a story. Did you ever get any pushback from the facility when you were there recording? 
Did you have yeah, to stop they, or? They wouldn't let me take, well, they didn't know I was recording most of the time. Well, most of the time I was recording because it was just family archival. Like it was like, you know, just have whatever you bring your phone. But when I wanted to take a picture of her wound, I was kicked out of the room. Okay. Is mm -hmm. that, was that, is that quote unquote legal, Rick? If you wanted to take a picture of a family member's wound? It depends on which state you're in. Okay. It is, it is. You know, so you have to um, check your state laws. It, it's generally legal if all the parties, relevant parties, it, including the person who's video and obviously is um, uh, consents to it. Um, I think the other aspect of it is, you know, for example, I think there are some states that have laws that prohibit it. Like I'm trying to think, I think it was Pennsylvania that was lay, saying that she was told it was illegal to uh, video what was happening with her loved one in the nursing home, but she was given wrong information. It was, it's not elite in Pennsylvania, as I understand it. And again, I'm not a Pennsylvania lawyer, so this is not legal advice, but just as an example of how the law varies in Pennsylvania, I believe you can video, but you can't do the sound. Okay. So you have to, so each state is, is different, but, but, you know, generally it's, it's you and your loved one and we're going to video your loved one. And uh, they'll try to, what the facility tries to do is to say, well, it's HIPAA, you know, because HIPAA is the answer to everything we don't want you to see. Right. And we don't want you to have, we're going to claim HIPAA, but, but HIPAA is again, a consensual. If, if the person's uh, who is the subject of uh, the, whatever it is, the information consents to it, then HIPAA no longer applies. That's, that's, you know, uh, if in, in Susie's case, she was the actual power of attorney or uh, person, legal guardian. So she had the ability to give consent for her mother because her mother was an Alzheimer's patient, obviously. So there was nothing illegal about that. She's, she's the person who can consent to her mother being filmed in a medical setting. And so nothing, you know, nothing illegal there, but it depends on the state depends on the particular facts and circumstances. One one follow-up question to that real briefly. What if it's legal in the state, but the facility that your loved one's in says it's against their policy? What supersedes the other? Um, they're going to say that. Um, and I think their policy is, 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 in my opinion, it has no legal uh, legs. Okay. okay? It because because they're governed, their policy is superseded by federal law and state law. Okay, uh, gonna but they're going to use that. They're going to use that because the people don't question that, right? right. People, and they're and here's the thing about the and Susie alluded to this earlier about the the power that those facilities exercise over uh, the residents and their loved ones. Because if the resident, if the if the loved one, if you're as as an, an advocate for your loved one in a facility, if you try to fight that a policy, what's your concern? Your concern is, well, are they going to kick me out? And and facilities do threaten that. They'll say, well, if you don't want to follow our policies, you can take your mother and and take her home. Okay, which is a untenable position for a loved one who doesn't have the ability to care for. The patient at home uh so they have this power where and, and you, know, you know the other thing you'd be concerned of as a um, caregiver for a loved one in a facility is well if i push back too hard are they going to retaliate when i'm not looking there you go. right okay yeah, and um so and uh, and you know there are facility i'll, I'll say this in my experience <laughs> you know i've i've done a lot of work i've prosecuted nurse uh uh, a nursing home and and the executives in a nursing home. I've gone and investigated nursing homes uh, for for care issues. And what I will say is that your frontline workers, your CNAs, your nurses that are hands on with the patients, they're trying to do the best they can. Right. What you've got to worry about are the supervisors, the directors of nursing, the administrators, the corporate executives who are the ones who are in a position to, and don't mind in my experience, retaliating uh, when they get someone who's too, you know, a, a caregiver who's too pushy right. uh, in their opinion. 
Uh, right. But the frontline workers are generally trying to do their jobs under adverse circumstances. And, and most of it is understaffing. I was going to say understaffed. It's yeah. understaffing. <clears throat> Why would a facility understaff? Well, because most of the facilities, 70% or more, are for profit. To max and, and the goal of a, a corporate facility is to maximize profit. And the, and the way you maximize profit is to cut down your costs. And your biggest cost is uh, are your, your personnel. So if you're going to maximize profit to the greatest extent, you've got to minimize your staff. And that's what they do. They actually do that. The result is you have staff who are unable to, as much as they'd like to, care for all the residents. And you have, I think, an immediate loss of dignity because you have residents who, were, uh, who are, who have to be helped to go to the bathroom. There are insufficient staff to do that for all the residents. So now, the the most undignified thing, you know, and I, I, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is is hope that this film gets people to put themselves in the place of a person in a nursing home who needs help to go to the bathroom because if they don't wait for help, they're going to fall and, you know, suffer serious injury. And they're left to soil themselves, to basically urinate on themselves, to defecate on themselves. And there are countless tales of staff telling someone who's ringing a call bell, I got to go to the bathroom, just go ahead and do it in your Adult diaper will take care of it later. Right. Talk about an immediate, total, degrading loss of dignity. That is what a nursing home, the nursing home system today does to people. It's an immediate, total, you know, degrading loss of dignity. And then from that flows all the other uh, more serious ills, the pressure sores, because there's not enough movement and you mix uh, bodily fluids with open wounds and you have infection and they get worse and they be, you know, you have dehydration because people aren't uh, given enough to drink because the staff is unable to do that because there's not enough staff. You have uh, malnutrition because they can't be properly fed. Many residents have to be helped in their feeding and that takes time. Well, time means staff. Well, we don't want to pay to the staff. So that's out the window. And dehydration and malnutrition leads to all kinds of other elements and, the, you know, infection and uh, ultimately death. Right. And so what you have, people need to think about um, having some empathy with someone who was denied fluids for six months. Imagine, imagine if we were not able to drink water for six months or for even two days. Right. how torturous that would be. Uh, so that's why I, I talk in terms of those of nursing homes being, you know, complete lack of dignity for the residents and torture. That's, that's what they are. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, I left the, I was in the uh, state attorney general's office for the last three years of my career in Virginia. And I was asked to, to look into issues dealing with nursing homes and the quality of care. And I talked to many uh, uh, caregivers whose loved ones were in those nursing homes. And they would come to me and give me tales of, well, my loved one, my mother, elderly mother, uh, when I went to see them, they had been sitting in their own, you know, urine and dirty di diaper for six or seven hours. Um, you know, they weren't fed on time. They didn't have a drink. The call button was unanswered. I would hear those tales over and over again. And my response, unfortunately, had gotten to, yeah, I'm very sorry you had your your loved one had to go through that. I'm very sorry you had to go through that. But that unfortunately, that is the standard of care in our nursing homes today. And it shouldn't be that way. We are paying the, the taxpayer is paying two hundred dollars roughly per day for a Medicaid patient and $500 and upward a day for a Medicare patient. And we are not getting our money's worth. We are not paying that kind of money, you know, $6,000 a month up to $15,000 a month per resident 
for those nursing home companies to run torture chambers and to strip away the dignity of the residents. Absolutely. That's outrageous, and that needs to be changed. Real, real quick question, uh, Rick, on the staffing issue, because I, I agree full heartedly that they are understaffed, and usually the primary reason is because it's being ran like a business and the profit is the main objective. Would any of that staffing issue be solved if there was a law mandating that nursing homes or any facility has to have X amount of staff per patient ratio? Yes. And why? Absolutely. Do, why is there not a law mandating that? Because the nursing home lobby pours m- millions of dollars into okay. our elected officials, like Big Pharma, into their campaigns, just like Big Pharma. Uh, but but I've you know I've read that the nursing home lobby is the they're even more powerful and wow. they're v- much more under the radar about how they do it. And so um, there have been studies for the last twenty five years about what the, a, an appropriate staffing ratio should be. Obviously, it depends on the acuity, what they call the acuity, the condition of the residents. And right now, Medicare and Medicaid do pay more if if the residents have a higher need based on their their fragility or their their condition. But um, there needs to be a uh, federal minimum staffing standard, and it needs to be enforced. Thank you. Okay, that's the second component because, you know, right now there there are no federal minimum standards. There are some state standards that are uh, usually woefully too low, woefully in a, uh, you know insufficient. But there are no federal standards. So when a you know the feds go about enforcing it, they're trying to enforce a standard that uh, I think uh, at least one court has said is completely nebulous, all right? The standard is, right now, is that the nursing home must have sufficient staff to take care of the needs of the residents. That's the standard. That's virtually unenforceable, okay? If there was a set standard of, well, it should be about, I think, 4.1 hours per resident per day is what the all the studies that have been done over the last 25 years have shown, then you have a definite number that a regulator can go into a facility and look at how they're being staffed and say, you are in violation or you're you're not, you're in compliance. Uh, if you had that number, you could then enforce that standard. That number does not exist right now because the nursing home lobby does not want it to, and Congress has not passed any kind of law because the nursing home lobby is pouring you know, hundreds of millions of dollars into the campaign chests of our elected officials. I want to add to that too. In California, at least, in, you know, we have a minimum that's the state regulated and it's not adhered to. And right. they, and at times there's just bodies in there. There's just bodies that aren't, you know, when there's surveyors that come in, there'll, there'll be bodies in there that aren't trained, that are doing a disservice really and so there, and that's not in, you know, there's no, regu- no one's coming in and, and, you know, it's just checking out the boxes. Okay. So they have that many people. Good. You know, but I'm here to tell you, I could tell you there, it was crickets in the hallways when I was there. Yeah. I, 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 I had to hunt people down to find somebody. So, you know, it has to be, there has to be regulations and then they have to be able to enforce them. Right. So that that's a problem. And then and then then it gets to the transparency of the business, the business model. And, you know, how is this happening? Because it's like organized crime. It's basically, you know, these venture capitalists who are investing in in nursing homes and using our family members as commodities. Right. You know, because there's there's a whole check system of like, you know, oh, they get reimbursed twenty nine thousand dollars for intubation. Might as well intubate them. They're old. It's, you know, it's expected. No, like that's the last thing you want to do for an elderly person is to intubate them. My mom was intubated three times without my permission. Mm. One time is too much. But they get paid for that. They get big bumps for that. And I'm not, that's not a conspiracy theory. That's a fact. I'm just, that is a fact. And and the problem is it's either, they're either, 
undertreated or overtreated, depending on what's what is valuable at that moment. And so that's a big problem. That's that's and that's that's due to the the lack of transparency in in the accounting. And you know, as long as there's no transparency, then we can't really point a finger at it. We know it's happening. Am right. I saying that right, Rick? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> maybe another way of saying it, just to to amplify that, mm -hmm. is what the nursing home lobby will say about federal minimum federal staffing standards is that um, we can't afford it unless you increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate and the Medicare reimbursement rate. We can't afford, you know, we're all barely making money as it is. We're losing money. We can't afford uh, minimum staffing standards uh, and we'll all go out of business. Well, they make that argument, yet they don't want to show um, the to to um, show their finances. And what the problem with the nursing home books and the way they run the business is that Many of those homes, um, especially the ones that are run by um, by, by corporate entities, um, they have a number of related party transactions that don't show up on the financial statements that they give to CMS, the government organization that oversees Medicare and Medicaid. And, and so what you'll have is a nursing home paying rents to a landlord, to a company that owns the building and the real estate. And those rents are very, very high. You'll have a nursing home that's uh, paying a fee to a management company to basically manage the nursing home. You'll have a nursing home that's paying a fee uh, to for back office support. That's the accounting aspects of it, the bookkeeping and the bill payment aspects of it. And, and what you don't... And vendors, too. And other vendors like yeah. physical therapy firms yeah. and staffing firms. But what you don't see on the reports is that those other entities that are getting paid that money, they're all related to the owners of the nursing home. They're all, all entities. The yeah. So they're basically paying themselves and they're paying themselves excessive amounts of rent. They're paying themselves excessive fees for uh, quote, management. They're paying themselves excessive fees for doing the books and records. Uh, that's how they bleed money out of the nursing homes, take it in the form of profit. Um, and they want to increase and keep that money flowing. So the way to do that is to keep the staffing level as low as possible. Uh, and, and, you know, you hear stories all the time of one certified nursing assistant responsible for 15 20, 25, 30, maybe sometimes even 50 residents on a shift, one person. And they're getting paid, I guess now they're paid 15 bucks an hour, maybe, but they're getting paid 12 to $15 an hour. Uh, you know, and so they're given a task that's impossible. It's impossible for one a certified nursing assistant to care for more than for 10 or more uh, patients. Uh, in a shift. Okay. But that's what they're being required to do. So, you know, not only do you have the abuse of the residents for profit, you also have the abuse of the, the uh, staff, the workers, the frontline workers in nursing homes who are, you know, for the, the majority of whom are women and the majority of whom are of color. And so you've got this whole other dynamic of how they make money is they stress out their staff. They abuse their staff and they end up abusing, ended up with, with the abuse and uh, neglect of the residents. All of it, 80% of it being paid by federal monies, by our taxpayer monies. And so even if people are don't want to think about getting old, you know, dying, oh, old people, you know, they're uh, yucky. I don't want to look at them. Even if, if you have normal people, they ought to be thinking about, well, your money is going to pay for these uh, torture chambers uh, where people are stripped of their dignity and then tortured to death. Right. They ought to be thinking about that. And if it happened in a nursery school, everyone would be up in arms. 
Yeah. If a child was left in diapers for six hours, seven hours, not fed, no water, no bottle, what would happen? That place would be shut down. Those people would be arrested. Or even a pet store, right? I mean, we wouldn't yeah. we wouldn't treat pets yeah. or dogs this way. I mean, yeah, that, no, it's disgusting. Yeah. It's yeah. disgusting. Are, is you know, are you angry yet? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, that's the point. Like, get angry, everybody, because we have to make us. We have to really. It has to be a public outcry because the traditional ways of advocacy are not working. It's been going on for decades, and it's not working. So we need to do. We need to change the way that we're advocating, and we need. We need to. You know, we need a movement. We need a movement, you know, not to be uh, corny, but it is. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, much like how the Alzheimer's Association started and these other organizations, enough people became aware of the issue and they united to make one loud voice. And that's why you call your film No Country for Old People, right? Because they are the last ones to be thought of. They don't have necessarily the advocacy ability that you would if it was a child or, you know, like we said, even a pet. Why don't you walk us through your film, Susie, that you and uh, Rick had put together and where are you at in the production and what are your hopes for the film? Well, my hopes again are to get people pissed off and get them so angry that they, you know, that they actually take a look, feel, you know, and feel gutted and want to do something about it. Right now, we we have interviewed over 60 people, 60 experts and caregivers and frontline workers, providers, um, people that have been policymakers that have been advocating for decades, like I said, you know, high level, other attorneys, um, amazing, strong voices for this cause. And um, we're about halfway through We've partnered with the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care, which is a nonprofit, was started back in 1975, folks, with Ralph Nader. And they're still doing the same thing. It's like echo chambers, you know? And so there's a lot of there's a lot of advocacy groups that have been around forever, the Grey Panthers in New York City, and like I said, Canner, and amongst others, the Essential Coalition, Caregivers Coalition which are fighting against isolation, which was another egregious thing that we did to our elders. You know, we that's another form of torture. Um, so we are raising the money. We've been raising money as we're as we're producing. It's it's a difficult thing. It's it's a hard time to raise money, but we are looking for more money. I'm, you know, to be blunt, we're, that is one thing that we're looking, we really need that. So I I'm, I'm appreciate your platform so that we can ask for that because, and I don't, I, and I literally hate asking for money, but I'm not going to be shy about this project because this project important. deserves it. Yeah. It deserves it. It needs it. And we're not asking for a lot and it's tax deductible and um we just want to pay people the, you know, what they deserve to, to provide this project on, on a level that reaches the mass. And Susie, mm -hmm. where can people go if they want to donate? Well, I, you're, they're going to go to your show notes and, and find the link to the National Consumer Voice documentary. It's it's dedicated to our documentary, No Country for Old People. And um, uh, that's the best way because I'm not going to say it out loud because you're never going to remember it that way. So, but just go, you know, you or you can find me, Susie Singer Carter, on any of the, uh, uh, any social media platform. I am there. And every one of my platforms has the link because that's where my head, that's where I, my heart is right now. And um, really appreciate it. It doesn't have to be a lot. You know, if you're very wealthy, make it a lot. If you're not, <laughs> and if you can't afford a dollar, I get it. Share it with somebody that you think might, because, you know, I, I understand that, that times are hard and we're coming out of a pandemic. But there are people that can that are philanthropists that and this this is not my I say this in my in my write up. This is not just my mother's story. This is everyone's story. And it could be somebody watching or listening. It could be their story tomorrow and they don't know it yet. Right. And that's the thing. 100 percent. This, you know, this isn't a race issue. This is not a political issue. This is not a color issue. This is a people issue. And it's humanity. It's, it's an equal opportunity. Yes. And everybody watching or listening to this or who has heard of No Country for Old People, 
at some point our loved ones very well could end in end up into a facility and, and the, you and, and you yourself right and the you treatment's going to be the same because of these issues that you and Rick have so eloquently laid out and that we've personally experienced firsthand both for our family members and from working in this field I just wanted to follow up on the staff issue again. You know, these frontline workers, like Rick said, it's not for a lack of wanting or for even trying, but it's not obtainable. You cannot take care of that many people and provide the type of care and the quality of care that they deserve for whatever the reason is that they are there when you're the only person doing it. If you have to do a complete bed change, let's say, because somebody soiled the bed or wet the bed, but the person down the hall has the call light on because they need to use the restroom. A couple of things. You're not going to know that the call light's on because you're in this patient's bedroom getting them cleaned up and changing their linens. And that is a process. And now that person most likely will become incontinent in their bed. You know, it's just a revolving cycle that needs to stop. And it needs to stop sooner rather than later because all of our loved ones and ourselves, like you said, Susie, are at risk for going through the same exact thing. And we're gonna help promote No Country for Old People as much as we can. We're gonna have the links up on the screen and in the show notes. And I believe you provided some video clips as well for people that wanna learn more about the film. And we're just really imploring people, you know, make a donation with your heart. You know, donate what you can, if you can, because this is a story that needs to have more attention and light shined on it because the work the two of you are doing is so commendable, but it's so important too. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Really appreciate it. Yeah. I really appreciate your support. And, and um, yeah, I mean, just, just share, 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 because that, that if we can get the word out, that's, that's the best thing because it'll get to somebody that can go, Oh, that's easy. <laughs> And, you know, we never know where it's going to come from, but it will come because this has to happen. Right. Absolutely. And my mom is fierce and she's up there going, okay, my daughter's down there. I'm, <laughs> she's busy up there. And yeah, I just <laughs> want to mention too, and then I said Rick wanted to jump in. Uh, you had a beautiful picture of you and your mom celebrating a birthday on social media recently. So, yeah. you know, I, I know how near and dear this is to you. And, you know, we're going to do everything we can to help share this work and help promote the film. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. From, well, for Norma and for all the Normas and Norms out there, it's really important. So thank you so much. We so appreciate this. You're welcome. Rick, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that this film is important because it, it's going to provide people with information they they don't know about the nursing home system that that they need to know. Right. Uh, number two, it's going to provide uh, it's going to provide a tool to be used to convince our legislators that to do the right thing. You know, it's not don't you know the money that you get from the nursing home lobby should not prevent us from doing the right thing with our elderly. Um, and so, and, and, it, and it should be used, viewed as a tool to get our policymakers and our agencies that are in charge of regulating this business to get them to do their jobs, to establish minimum staffing standards and to do the enforcement that's necessary. That's kind of what this film, it's, it's not, it, it's meant to be, uh, to, to be something to be used to change the system as quickly as possible, because every day people are suffering in these facilities. As we speak, people are suffering, and we need to to do everything we can to eliminate that suffering. And I just want so, to say, I, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the most traumatic issues about this is there is no change on the horizon because they're not going to change unless they are forced to change. You know, this isn't just like a temporary issue where, you know, in three months, everything should get better. This is an ongoing issue that will not change unless change is made for them. Yes, we, we, we got to make change. It's, it's you know, uh, we can't we can't keep going forward with the same you know business as usual as much as the industry would like it. Right. That's not that's not what we should be doing. 
I want to just uh, thank you guys for your time. But before we go, I want to ask you each one question. And I think this will be maybe a varying answer. You know, you, Susie, from your personal experience, maybe Rick from his professional one. But what is one solid piece of advice you would want a viewer or listener to know if they have a loved one in a nursing home right now? Well, I, you know, and I have told this to to caregivers that they need to be there constantly as much as they can. They need to be present because uh, and they need to be making sure that their loved one is getting the care that they they need. Uh, you know, they've got to be an advocate. Uh, they have to be as much as we all want to be liked by people, they're going to have to, pro you know, maybe be disliked by the administration at a nursing home because they have got to be an advocate for their loved one. Otherwise, uh, they're going to, you know, potentially be neglected. I second that emotion. That's about, that's the best thing I can tell you right now. That's the best thing you can do is be there and advocate. Be the advocate, be mm -hmm. the squeaky wheel. And right. don't worry if you're liked or disliked because the center, the central point is the care right. of your loved one that's in that facility. And if a loved one does have an issue with their mom, their father, whoever it is that's in that facility, and they're not getting any resolution from the facility, who should they reach out to? Well, they can reach out to the state ombudsman. That's one place, uh, you know, so, some of them are better than others, depending on which state uh, mm -hmm. you're in. But their their job is to be the advocate for the residents, the okay. ombudsman program. Um, you know, the other place, they, if they're uh, a Medicaid patient, which so many of them are, especially the ones in long-term care, they can reach out to the state's Medicaid fraud control unit. Some of the states have uh, better uh Medicaid fraud control units and others. The Medicaid fraud control unit is usually part of the attorney general's office. Um, they can reach out to uh, Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General. There's a hotline there, and, and they're the federal agency that's responsible for uh, elder abuse in nursing facilities because half of Medicaid money is federal money and half of it's state money generally. So those are the three that come right off the top of my head that that are, you can ha can help you be a squeaky wheel. I just want to uh, I just want to thank Rick Montcastle and Susie Singer Carter, both of you, for your time today and for the tremendous advocacy work that you are both doing for families and their loved ones in these facilities. Okay. Both a part of No Country for Old People, and we're gonna put the links and all of the connections into our show notes for people to find you if they want to make a donation. And I just want to thank you both again and look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So it was a pleasure, guys. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Hi, Mom. It's me, Susie. What happened? What's the matter? You're hurting her. She's on the tube. Oh, it's bleeding. I know. Sorry. Uh. I mean, I just got off the phone with uh, one of one of my guests from my podcast, who has been really good, supportive. He's been helping me through this with my mom and giving me advice.
Irishman mom. You might have heard of her. She sings opera when she was nine. And then she had her own radio show when she was 16, like a big shot, in New York City on CBS, right? And then she belted out a song and he went, whoa, whoa, what? Who's singing that? And they all said, her, the little one, with the big voice. Right? That was you. Everyone loved Norma. Right? Yeah. Everyone. All the men, all the women, but a lot of men, too. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> and the autumn weather. You singing. You singing with me? We just did the whole movie. Good? <laughs> <laughs> goody, 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 good. It's been really hard this whole four months, and um, I am a wreck from this, and um, trying to be strong for my mom. I haven't been able to work and um, I just feel unmotivated and I feel impotent to help my mom. What kind of words you got for me? <laughs> what kind of words you got? Like maybe, I love you? <laughs> like maybe, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. What in the world? Like, I'm tired. And obviously depressed, and I feel like I've been going through her dying for the past four months because everyone's telling me that she's dying, but she doesn't die. But they're trying to make her die faster than she wants to. dry you have a dry throat I know that's from not having liquid I'm gonna get you liquid right now okay I'm gonna get you juice Good job, mommy. Suck on it. Get the juice out. 
good girl. Okay, now. Ah. And, and as a result, she's in pain because they're not taking care of her. crazy because I'm there every day and and I still am fighting to get people to pay attention so and I'm also the enemy there now and that doesn't feel good so <sighs> it's really hard for one person to to advocate, let alone, I can't imagine the people that have no one to advocate. I'm Rick Mountcastle, former United States Attorney for the Western District of Virginia, an award-winning federal and state prosecutor. You may be familiar with my work prosecuting Purdue Pharma for fraudulently marketing OxyContin when I was portrayed by Peter Sarsgaard in the Emmy-nominated limited miniseries Dope Sick on Hulu. Well, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure justice is served. Additionally, I spent much of my career prosecuting healthcare companies and executives who exploited vulnerable patients for profit. But despite dozens of criminal convictions and the recovery of millions of dollars in penalties, there was no improvement in a broken system. That's why I'm a producer of No Country for Old People, a critically needed documentary inspired by award-winning filmmaker Susie Singer Carter's experience caring for her beloved mother, Norma, against a corrupt long-term care system. Despite Susie's best efforts, Norma died from what was inarguably egregious nursing home neglect and abuse. The film chronicles the last six months of Norma's life in a five-star nursing home and presents the desperate need for transition out of the current profit for people paradigm that governs the American long-term care and nursing home system. I know the futility of trying to take on a system that is so stacked against you. That said, Susie knows the power of storytelling as evidenced by her award-winning Oscar qualified short film, My Mom and the Girl, starring Valerie Harper. I love it. Now, Susie and I, along with an impressive list of the most talented and respected advocates and experts, are 100% committed to changing a system that allows exploitation of our most vulnerable citizens. Now that you know the nursing home system is broken, I hope you will care enough to help fix it. 
I encourage you to donate to the production of this extremely crucial film that, as Susie says, promises to pack a much needed gut punch that forces the public to look at a healthcare system that is literally collapsing around us. Please make your 100% tax deductible donations via the dedicated page on the National Consumer Voice site today. Because although this is Norma's story, it's really all of ours. Everyone loved Norma, right? Yeah, everyone, all the men, all the women, but a lot of men too. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> months and um, I am a wreck from this and i um, trying to be strong for my mom and um, when I haven't been able to work and um, I just feel unmotivated and I feel impotent to help my mom I'm tired and obviously depressed and I feel like I've been going through her dying for the past four months because everyone's telling me that she's dying, but she doesn't die. But they're trying to make her die faster than she wants to. Hi, I'm Susie Singer-Carter. A year ago on January 15th, 2022, I embarked on a six month journey trying to navigate a system that I've since discovered is severely broken. I didn't know what to believe or who to trust. And that's why I'm doing this documentary, No Country for Old People. I wanna share what I've since learned and what most people don't know until it's too late. I don't want any more of our vulnerable loved ones to suffer because of greed. To help, I've brought together some of the most intelligent and candid lifelong advocates for serious nursing home reform, the courageous. Truth requires courage. Courage requires fortitude. Truth requires integrity. Cowards tell lies. Cowards support liars. Telling a lie is easy. Believing a lie is easy. Being compliant is easy. Staying silent is easy. It takes all the courage in the world to question the status quo and to speak up and tell the truth. Trust the courageous. You can support the fight for crucial reform by making a tax-deductible donation for the production of No Country for Old People on the National Consumer Voice website today. Because although this is my mother's story, it could be yours. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions, every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms or watch the show on our official YouTube channel. Just make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. We'd also like to say thank you again to Rick Montcastle and Susie Singer-Carter for joining us to discuss their film, No Country for Old People. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next time here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.